Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewek. A warm welcome to everyone to this new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. We have another great conversation ahead. Let's get right into it with uh, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. And we're going to go first to Phil. Thanks, John. I thought this week I'd talk about something I read just the other day. It was actually published uh, quite a while ago, back in April of 2021. It was actually the Lunch with the FT column that runs every week, which I highly recommend if, if people haven't read that before, it's worth checking out most of the time. So this was April 16th of this year. And uh, the subject was Sir David Spiegelhalter, who's an academic in, in the UK. And the title of it was Risk is a Very Loaded Term, which immediately got my attention. I think we've talked a lot about risk on this podcast, and in particular, my view of it and, and one of the things that runs through my brain on an almost daily basis, my favorite definition of risk, which is attributed to Elroy Dimson, another uh, UK uh, person, investor, academic. Uh, and, and his definition of risk is that risk means more things can happen than will happen. And I think that's just about one of the most useful frameworks for thinking about investing in life that I've ever come across. And it gets into all sorts of implications. And we've talked about it in the context of counterfactuals and all sorts of other things. But in this case, Sir David Spiegelhalter talked about risk and said it's a very loaded term that only addresses the downside. And in this case, he means really the outcome. He talks about lottery tickets and other things. And he says, I much prefer thinking in terms of potential benefits and harms. In other words, the impact. It's a clumsier, but more reflective way of what we actually experience in our own lives decisions. He goes on to talk about you know, how everything is uncertain, right? I mean, he, he did a lot of work around the COVID pandemic, and goes on to talk about how following the science actually doesn't mean anything because science acknowledges the uncertainty that's inherent in almost everything. And if you say follow the science, it really doesn't mean what you often think it means. It's kind of one of those, you know, popular phrases and buzzwords that's out there that <laughs> comes with a different implication from what the speaker intends a lot of the time. I think, um, but the you know it goes on to point out, of course, it's impo- it's very important that we follow the process of science. And just acknowledge the uncertainty and the mistakes. He acknowledges a bunch of the things he got wrong about the COVID pandemic. Um, and, and he goes on to reflect about what it meant when he lost his son at the age of five. So his, his son was diagnosed with cancer at 11 months um, and unfortunately ended up passing away at the age of five. And, and it asked, the interviewer asked him if it impacted his, his view on risk and the things that he gone through in life. He said, no, it actually just taught him the importance of luck and that whatever you want to call it, use the terms unavoidable, unpredictability, chance, fate. There are certain things that just happen. We shouldn't overestimate the amount of control we have, which I thought was just you know, a very thoughtful and poignant way to, to phrase it, but even though you're talking about something as unfathomably painful as, as losing a child at a young age, which I really can't imagine. So the me of the interview then goes on and he talks about his work with COVID and in one of his big criticisms of the response, he kind of had an interesting take on, on travel restrictions and lockdowns. But he said one of the biggest issues he had with the whole thing was what he called number theater, where public officials were just reeling off lots of big numbers, which I knew were very unreliable. He's a, tr- he's a trained statistician. You know, he knew what the numbers were capable of describing and what they weren't capable of describing. And so he saw the whole thing as just number theater, putting out these numbers in the public bank, in, the, in the public arena, which were just you know, more counterproductive than anything else. He hopes that one offsetting positive would be a more data literate public, but I totally disagree there. I think if anything, that if there's anything the pandemic's proven us, it's that the public amount of literacy and, and numeracy when it comes to data and statistics is shockingly low. And if anything, I think maybe this inspired a few people out there to fill that hole in their knowledge, but I doubt it. Uh, very few will take that chance. And I, if anything, it's just made people dig their heels in and, and throw their hands up at the impossibility of it all. Uh, but he, he goes on to make some really good points. He said, 
he if he could train people into data literacy, it would be to have more people see numbers and statistics as quote arguments that can change our emotions unquote rather than cold hard facts. They can be chosen, they can be framed, they can be manipulated to support any argument of a person's choosing. And if you're going to be on the other side of any set of numbers and statistics, and this is where the investment implications become pretty obvious, one must have that critical ability to examine one's feelings and motivations in order to understand the numbers as they're presented. It's so easy to come to the wrong conclusions or to any conclusion. Sometimes you can't come to any conclusion at all. So that's where I, I kind of wanted to stop and, and pose the question because I think the implications are just so obvious. I mean, this touches on basically all of my favorite topics in investing. You know, we've talked a lot about how the, the number one rule of investing is to not fool, fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool, kind of a bastardized version of a thought or a soundbite that's attributed to Richard Feynman. And that certainly speaks to this with with the superpower added that when you see reams of data and lots of numbers presented, it, if anything, it just makes you even more confident and likely more overconfident in what you think you know. And I think this is just a hugely important point to be made. So the question I started asking myself is where are we playing number theater in the investment world? And I think it's everywhere. I see it probably most prominently in the quarterly earnings parade, which is about to start again here. Uh, this week with the third quarter numbers that are going to be reported, where you just see reams of data reported out of companies. Uh, and it we all know that it's completely and totally unreliable a lot of the time in terms of what we're looking for, at least, or at least what I'm looking for, which is you know some signal and all that noise about what makes for a good investment and what doesn't, or what even makes for a sustainable company and what doesn't. Um, this is not an argument against the less reporting. If anything, we we, we need that that data and that transparency, but it's the way that it's presented, right? It's the way that the data are massaged and framed and chosen and sometimes even manipulated down to the community adjusted EBITDA level, for example, <laughs> to just completely drive a narrative that's, that is pure theater, right? I, I also see it, it, it's, it's apostasy in some ways to say that macro data can be a really important part of what we do as investors if you're in a certain camp in that debate. I, I do consume macro data. I think I'm careful about it. I think I'm doing it in a way that informs my process rather than swamps it with lots of noise. But let's be honest. I mean, the vast, vast majority of macro data is number theater. You know, For all the hullabaloo that gets made about macro data that comes out that really paints a clear and an informative picture, I'm thinking back now to the financial crisis and the housing crisis of, you know, almost 13, 14 years ago now, and a lot of the macro data there um, really did tell an important story. And ever since, it really hasn't told much of a story. You know, we were, we were warned of hyperinflation that didn't really materialize. We were warned of a double dip recession that really didn't materialize. We were warned of an impending European monetary union disintegration that didn't really happen. So, I mean, there's lots of false signal out there, and it really amounts to a lot of numbers theater. Um, but, you know, that's why this is so insidious is because there's always the exception that proves the rule. We talked on and on again about how you have to be able to hold two competing thoughts at once. And this is another example of it. And another thing that stands out to me is, is trying to find where I'm forgetting to stop and understand my own emotions and my own incentives when I'm evaluating numbers. Uh, you know, the, the endowment effect, you know, it, it's just so rampant in, in investing. And I, I'm sure on an almost daily basis, there's something that I'm predisposed to like for reasons that it should be right in front of me, for example, if I already own an investment or if I've met the CEO and think she's wonderful or whatever the case may be, you know, that just completely frames the numbers that can come out in, 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 any, given, in any given situation. And then lastly, where are we drawing conclusions from numbers when no such conclusions should be drawn? And here again, I mean, the quarterly earnings parade is just an obvious answer where, you know, if you're going to hold things for a period of years, the chances that you should be drawing a conclusion from any set of quarterly data are, are pretty low, right? I mean, it's not to say it's zero. I mean, it might be one out of 10 times, maybe one out of 100 times. It's not zero, um, but it's not every time either. And I think that's part of the issue is you spend a few hours going through quarterly press releases, 10 Qs, transcripts, and you think, well, now I have to take action on this information. And that's often, I mean, that's, that's a mistake, in my opinion. It's not every time. It's not even half the time in my opinion, if you're going to hold something for years. Um, 
Likewise, you know, is the stock market cheap or expensive? I mean, we spend, we collectively spend a lot of time debating that. I, I have no idea if the stock market's cheap or expensive at any given moment, the vast majority of the time. I mean, there are maybe a handful of such opportunities in your lifetime where you're going to really have a reason to make that kind of call. And I don't think this is one of them, frankly, but, um, you know, I, I think that's where, at least for me, no such conclusions should be drawn. Even in the case of a single security, um, I think it gets really, really tough. That's why we try to pick our spots. You know, if you're going to be a concentrated investor, you're by definition trying to pick your spots. So anyway, those were the three questions that really jumped out to me. Where are we playing number theater and in investing in number theater? You know, kind of a peekaboo show. That's going to be like a recurring thing for me to think about. Definitely a piece of the the mental framework that I'm going to try to refer back to a lot. You know, is this is this meaningful is it, and is it lasting or is it just number theater? You know, where are we forgetting to understand our own emotions and our own incentives? And where are we drawing conclusions from numbers where we really shouldn't be? So I'm going to open those three questions up to you guys and see what you think. Yeah, no, this is a great topic. I think it's really interesting. I love how you introduced it and where we're going with it. I was having a conversation last week with a friend who was talking about Jeffrey Gunlack's short home builders uh, pitch in like Arizona 2011 might be off on the year, but roughly around that time coming out of the financial crisis, but not, you know, when we were, when we were at least one or two years uh, post it. And he's like, you know, he and his shop were looking at the numbers and we're like, wow, this is a really bullish setup for housing for the long term. And Gunlack's like, everything's going down. And it's like two really Google machine. It was 2014, believe it or not. 2014. Okay. Yeah. I knew it was, yeah. I knew it said after the GFC, but like yeah. close to it. And it's like, that's, you know, a great example of how, you know, before we even get into numbers theater, like it's not even about manipulating numbers. Two people can literally look at the exact same thing, be very smart, have similar skin in the game and the same objective to get it right. And yet, you know, someone's obviously got to be wrong in that. Um, but then there's another degree of that too. And I encounter it a lot in the market where you get these groups of people who are like, well, I really like the five-year uh, outlook here, but I don't like what it looks like over the next year. Um, I feel like that's something that's pretty common and it's not exactly number theater, but it's something where, you know, like numbers are interpreted in their own way and people come to their own conclusions. So then with number theater, I think of you know, they're really small and there are big things that people do um, to, to make effect. Um, so the first one that comes to mind is obviously quoting Dow points. Like whenever my mom thinks or talks about the stock market, she's I'm like, oh, the S&P moved like 50 basis points or 1%, big move, yada, yada. She's like, no, 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 no. How many Dow points did it move, right? And, um, you know, I couldn't think of something more irrelevant to even if you wanted to express what the market's doing in the near term, um, how many Dow points. I couldn't even like tell you within, uh, I don't know, a thousand points of where the Dow is right now. I just don't even look at it ever. Um, another is just generally switching from absolute values to percents and vice versa. I think a lot of people will use whichever is more impactful for the point they're trying to make. Insofar as actually managing money goes, I've found myself re-gearing my brain entirely to think in percents, though. Um, so I think that's very important. And I think specifically in that context, it's very important. Though in certain contexts, you do have to start thinking about absolute values outside of like managing money. But in certain areas, in certain studies and analyses, you might want to think about absolute values. But there are some people who use uh, one or the other very manipulatively to tell different stories. Um, I think very recently you're starting to see things with year over year versus two year growth stacks and a company will point you to whichever is most uh, favorable in telling their story, though I think both are quite illustrative. Um, you know, to me, the honest way to do it is uh, if there's something in each of them that's worth showing, you show both. You don't just pick one uh, or the other. Um one of one of the ones I, I was thinking of as you were telling that story, Phil, um, the uh, number of slides in an activist deck. I remember people fawning over how many damn slides Ackman had in his Herbalife short thesis. Yep. And it's like, maybe the point of having that many slides was so that no one could think about any one or two of them and like can't even remember what's in there. Just like, oh my God. Um, 
I think that there was, was 305 wild. pages in the JC Penny report that all serves. Yeah, like what's that supposed to accomplish for you at a certain point? I mean, I, I've increasingly been of the belief we should try to shrink our thesis down to the fewest uh, number of slides or pages, whatever you want to do it on. And if you got to get that complex, there's probably something going wrong in there. And even for complex things, you should be able to simplify it. So, you know, that's definitely, I, I mean, that's the purest form of theater I've seen in some ways. Um and then one I've heard recently was a, a company citing like um, the organic brand uh, reach of the brand and using Instagram followers to tell the story. But um, I saw a verified report that they were actually purchasing a good chunk of those followers. So it's like, um, you know, if you if you train people on following an objective, you could find your own ways to game it. And that's kind of uh, bizarre. But those are some that come to mind. And I'm going to keep thinking as you go. Yeah, I'll jump in with just a few uh, comments and, and great topic, by the way, Phil. Um, you know, I think there's a, a couple of instructive sayings that that apply here. One is um, not all that counts can be measured or, or not everything that can be measured counts. And I think people often forget that. Um, and then lies, damn lies and statistics. I think that also sometimes applies where basically you can uh, come up with, you know, numbers to support whatever your thesis is, and and unfortunately, a lot of folks um, want to be proven right once they've kind of made up their mind, and they look for confirming evidence um, rather than the truth, and uh, you know that doesn't usually result in the best long term returns as an investor. Uh, but it's human nature. And, uh, you know, people who are smart, as, as Elliot, you pointed out, can come to very different conclusions. And I saw a tweet, I think, today uh, that made the point that, you know, you had a super smart investor, David Einhorn, um, back at some point uh, shorting Amazon and Netflix, two of the biggest winners of the last uh, decade or two, and meanwhile, earlier this year, he was pitching Fubo, which is a total also ran with terrible numbers. So it's really um, hard sometimes to know what numbers to believe, especially if, if something is outside of your circle of competence. Um, you know, I find myself consuming um, macro data, data on commodities and such, but I don't feel very comfortable coming to strong conclusions on, on any of these things because um, if I listen to someone who's been in the oil and gas industry for a long time, um, that person's going to come up with all kinds of numbers, why oil is going above 100. And it sounds all plausible, uh, but then you go and look at that person's track record through history, and basically you can see that no matter where oil was in, in all of history, the person has always been bullish and has had bullish numbers. So it, it it's really tough sometimes to to know what to believe. And and you know the earnings game is just so pronounced. The quarterly earnings game where companies manage expectations. Uh, there's even things like a whisper number. So there's an official consensus estimate, but then there's a there's another number that is the real number, and uh, and and games are played uh, around these things, and they can move stock prices in the short term. I think in the long term, uh, none of those things really matter. Um, but so many investors are focused on on those things that are really the wrong things to focus on if 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 you want to do well uh, long term. Yeah, I agree. That's a great example of pure theater. The whisper number. I mean, it's just. There's never been anything productive that's come from that. So, you know, it's not the kind of thing that I'd be in favor of legislating away or anything like that, but it's just such a waste of time. It's kind of stunning. And I, I really like, you know, the, the number of pages in a presentation as a, as a bit of theater. I mean, that's definitely theater, right? I mean, all you're trying to convey there, it, you know, it's like when you used to have a, a book report back in grade school and you didn't really read the book as well as you should have. So you thought, all right, I know what I'm going to do the teacher. I'm going to snow her with like a, 
fifth, you know, 50 page book report when all she asked for was five. <laughs> it's just pure, pure theater to try to, you know, compensate for a lack of half, a lack of intellectual half with physical half. So it's, uh, it's pretty silly. So those are good ones. Anyway, I just thought that was, uh, highly recommend the, the article, like I said, April 16th of this year in the, in the FT. And, uh, I'm going to be using, you know, the, the concept of numbers theater as a, as a go-to framework for myself going forward. Cool. Elliot, uh, over to you. Yeah. You know, I think, um, this one actually is a very nice segue from numbers theater. Cause I want to talk about numbers masking something that's happening in the market. Um, and what I'm getting at is if you look at the S and P, the S and P as we're recording this today is sitting about 4% off its recent slash all time highs. Um, but in my morning note that I get, I got a little graph that showed how the average member of each of the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and Russell 2000 are doing and how much each average, how much the average member of each is down from highs. Um, so in the S&P 500, the percent of members with at least minus 10% correction from year-to-date highs right now is 91%. In the NASDAQ, that number is 90%. In the Russell 2000, that number is 98%. Um, and for average member decline from year-to-date high in the S&P 500, it's 17%. In the NASDAQ, it's 38%. In the Russell 2000, it's minus 34%. So while the indices by and large look like they're doing really well, if you're not looking at the FANGs, the financials, the energy stocks, things are a very different story. And by and large, that's, you know, a good slice of the number of stocks, though not the aggregate uh, market cap of these indices. And I find those kinds of disconnects to be uh, very interesting. And I think by and large, since COVID, you know, we've talked about this in some other podcasts, but there is this major bifurcation early on coming out of March, 2020, where you had the winners and losers. And then you had, um, this big reopening trade that started with the vaccine announcements close to a year ago, but not quite like 11 months ago. And then, you know, starting uh, the middle of this, I guess after you had this runaway momentum trade from January into February, um, more ever since then, you've had this kind of like drifting down of a lot of parts of the market, especially the COVID winners. COVID winners have been, you know, amongst the weakest of that. I think that's part of why you see the average member of the NASDAQ is down over 2x, the average member of the S&P 500. And so you're starting to see some interesting uh, things take shape. I feel like research watch list has been um, as lush as it has been in a very long time. Um, And some of those companies during COVID whose stocks had really pronounced ascensions, starting to think like, hey, maybe this is my second chance. So I talked about that a little last week, like especially in these longer duration opportunities, you don't need to have FOMO that you'll have another chance to revisit these things. And so, you know, starting to get those sorts of um, windows, the the openings to kind of revisit some of those names that you may have started building a file on, but never completed the work on, never really had the opportunity um, to dive into. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking, I can't really remember another time where it was as pronounced where the market sitting near highs, but this many stocks are just that far away from it. And I know these periods happen from time to time, but, uh, I was curious. I wanted to ask you guys if you even noticed that this was going on, if you felt it was going on and what you think, um, it, are you finding any pockets of opportunity that you've been exploring, um, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't have guessed that if I'm reading this right, what you sent around that at least 91 or 91% of the constituent stocks in the S and P 500 are at least 10% below their year to date high, right? I'm exactly. reading that correctly. And 98% in the Russell 2000. Exactly. As of today. Yeah. I mean, I would have been low on those numbers. For sure, I would have guessed 65 or 70 or maybe 75, because I think if you look in any given year, it's very normal for those numbers to happen at some point. I wouldn't think we were quite there today. Uh, And likewise, I would have been quite a bit off on the average member decline 
of each of the indices. Uh, you know, the, the fact that the average Russell 2000 stock is 34% down from its year to date high, uh, I wouldn't have guessed anywhere near that, probably half as much. So, uh, but directionally, sure. I mean, it, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, look, I think two things would have been pretty clear to even a casual observer. One is that everything went up for a while. We've talked about this and particularly some of the crazy quote unquote COVID winners that went straight up. You know, it was just a matter of time for before a lot of those things kind of corrected a little bit. So not not a huge surprise. Again, the, the base rate of all this, I think is, I don't, I wouldn't have known exactly off the top of my head what the numbers look like, but I would have known it was relatively high that the, you spend lots and lots of time double digits below either the year to day, year to date high watermark or the all time high watermark, you know, that's just life in markets. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of opportunities, I guess I would refer back to to my segment a few minutes ago, which is I have a hard time drawing conclusions. I'm not sure uh, I can say anything too definitive other than either through correct analysis or a mistake on my part. I have not found a ton of new things to do this year. I think it's been relatively difficult. That could be a comment on prices relative to the opportunity, or it could be a comment on my shortcomings as an analyst to see through the fog and discern the value that's sitting right there in plain sight. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of brilliant insights beyond that. John, you want to bail me out? Uh, I can try, but I, you know, I, I guess I sort of noticed a little bit that some of those stocks had come off because whatever l- little amount of shorting that I do, I, I those are the kinds of names I would have shorted or, or did short a few of them. Um, and, and for me, it's a little bit in reverse because the names that I've liked, uh, which were some of the beaten down value names or energy, um, they a lot of them have rallied, um, so it's become a little bit harder to find um, good ideas, I'd say. But I feel like you know, like Peter Kundal said, there's always something to do if you have a portfolio of ten to twenty stocks or are reasonably concentrated. I feel like you can always find opportunities, um, even if they're special situations. Maybe something that's not necessarily directly correlated with the market. Um, and you know, then there are some quantitative screens that'll always spit out uh, ideas to look at, you know, like the uh, the Greenblatt magic formula screen is 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 unlike a Ben Graham net net screen, which could have zero um, ideas at, at some point. The Greenblatt screen is a relative uh, ranking, so it'll always have um, things to look at that that rank the highest um, on those uh, two Greenblatt metrics of quality and and uh, cheapness. Um, or there are some other screens. One screen I really like is uh, the O'Shaughnessy Tiny Titans screen, which is uh, available through AAII.com. They have a bunch of really good screens uh, that are back tested. And uh, that screen looks for companies that trade at less than one times revenue and have um, high relative strength. So basically, they tend to be companies that um, you know maybe had leverage or were simply beaten down and are now recovering, but are still cheap as they're at less than one times sales. And you're going to find some interesting companies to look at um, on on that screen. Uh, For example, some coal names showed up there uh, way before they actually had their huge uh, run-up. You know, they had already started running a little bit, but they were still extremely cheap. Or um, some special situation stocks. Um, I think a steel company that that caught my eye. Uh, I think it's called Steel Connect, uh, where um, the hedge fund Steel Partners has a stake, and it might get um, they might take over the company. And the question is, what the price is going to be? Um, I don't own it, and I'm not recommending it, but it's. You know, an idea that one could do more work on and potentially come to some sort of uh, conclusion or conviction. 
Um, I think we're getting to the point where there's some busted specs um, to maybe start taking a look at. Um, and I also still feel like there are some energy stocks that are playing catch up or, or need to still play catch up where um, basically, uh, you know, I, I feel like the market on energy is still a little bit in denial of what's going to be needed or what might be needed uh, to get us through this uh, energy crisis or kind of to the to the other end where at some point uh, renewables can you know fill the gap but uh, you know one name that that I'm looking at is Transocean the biggest uh, driller uh, kind of deep water driller in the world uh, again not a recommendation but just something to look at where basically um, management has said in the past um, and recently that you know they're very much a going concern and a strong company with oil at 55 a barrel and now we're at 80 a barrel and um, rig is nowhere near where it was trading a few years ago when oil prices were near that level or even lower uh, because I think people are still in denial that we're going to have to do more offshore drilling. It just doesn't fit the ESG uh, narrative. So, yeah, I feel like there are definitely things to look at. And just uh, lastly, to touch a little bit on, on Elliot's point that um, a lot of those high quality companies are off uh, by a lot. Um, you know, that's definitely... A, a segment where I want to start looking as well. Um, you know, I'm not sure they're beaten down enough um, for a, for a you know deep bargain bin hunter like myself. Uh, but definitely, you know, if you can get quality uh, on the cheap and kind of be positioned on the right side of long term change, um, yeah, I'd love to own that much more than a deep water driller, but at the end of the day, you're making kind of a risk reward uh, decision. So that's just a few thoughts. Yeah, those are a lot of good ones. I'm glad you mentioned in there also the busted SPACs and IPOs, because as you guys know, that's one of my favorite uh, setups there is. And there are some good companies that came public through the SPAC mayhem. Yeah, they you know probably knew they were tie- timing the market pretty well given what happened to their business in the last year. But that doesn't mean they don't have good longer term outlooks. Like when I say that, I'm thinking of a company like Traeger, which is probably worth some time to familiarize. They have cult like followers and um, you know people who are just uh, maybe introduced to barbecue in the last year, but still very committed to it. Um, so something like that's interesting. I know on the flip side of that, like or similarly, Weber went public around the same time, but their IPO was a little weird. They talked about installed base, their connected uh, app and language that you wouldn't expect from a barbecue company. Maybe it was some Traeger NV, NV because they're a little different. Um, I probably in ideas exploring, I should have mentioned the tweet I sent it out last week, which was a poll of which stock performs better from here on a per share basis over the next five years, Zillow or Peloton. And it's like, (laughs) the only responses I got to that, I I got a lot of responses to the poll and it was like interesting and funny and nice, Um, you know, 318 total total votes. But like every response was like, why are you asking this question? Or what's your point? Yada, yada, yada. And I think what's interesting in just thinking through the last like couple of years in the markets is like functionally, These two stocks have nothing to do with one another. Um, What drives each of their business has very little to do with one another. What risks they face, they really don't overlap very much. Um, Their their business model, like evolutions, there's really not much in common. Meanwhile, the stocks are, you know, basically uh, moving in tandem through this whole period. And so, at some point, you know, I think there's uh, I find both independently interesting and they're interesting things about each that are unique, that uh, make one look good, the other look good in its own right. Um, but, you know, I, I do expect there to be a day where the stocks separate. And, you know, I just thought it'd be really fun to ask that question and put it out there as I'm working on them. Sure enough, I did get some like really interesting responses from people who are 
<laughs> working on both in my direct messages. But those are the kind of stocks that I think right here, um, sitting 50% or more off their highs are probably worth at least a little time getting to know. Um, so yeah, I guess what happens is in times like heading out of COVID, you extrapolate the uh, trajectory um, acceleration uh, to infinity. And obviously that is not realistic. So this, this is where I'm hunting for the most part. It's somewhat of an aside, but I wonder if there's a quant out there that's ever done the math. I'm sure there is. Um, I, I think it would get you killed in a concentrated portfolio. So, I, and I'm not recommending it in anyone's <laughs> portfolio concentrated or otherwise. But you look at this kind of stuff where, okay, you just algorithmically buy the dip, right? I mean, that's basically all the world's been doing for you know quite some time now. And so, if you were to have just said anytime these 50 or 100 stocks or even the whole index, whatever index you're picking is X percent below its year to day high, I'm going to buy a little more. Uh, the arithmetic there would suggest you do pretty well over time. So long as you could suffer through the horrendous drawdowns when you continue to just buy all the way down through some very painful experience. And the, the two thoughts that I've always had on that, that have kept me from ever even becoming interested in it uh, enough to even look into the numbers is that one, you know, anyone but a handful of people over the age of what, 65 probably have never had a decade plus like where the market went totally sideways and really sucked, at least at a high level. I mean, obviously you had lots of individual stocks and the NASDAQ itself did that in our investment lifetimes, but you know, that would be a very painful way uh, to invest if we were heading into a period like that. And then likewise, I mean, I, I've just seen up close and personal too many of these kind of half-baked um, algorithmic decisions that can really get you into trouble. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget at my old firm when a lot of our uh, internal analysis and risk models and so forth were pointing at a huge buying opportunity in financials in the in the summer of 2007. And again, in the summer of 2008, ironically, so I, I don't know. I'm really skeptical of it. I, I just have defaulted personally into a business first uh, mindset. And if I can't understand the business itself and you know the mindset of buying the whole thing, why would I do anything different? But it, it does. Numbers like these do raise a really interesting question. Yeah, it definitely got me thinking. You know, while you're saying that about richer, wiser, happier, and the section on Bill Miller just averaging down on financials the whole way heading into '08. And my mind was like, yeah, basically any other sector where there's not too much leverage and it's not like financials or energy, it just might work when you buy at X percent off highs systematically. Um, reminds me of a little bit the rebalancing section in Fortune's formula about Claude Shannon and how he used cash strategically to like scale out of positions when things are working and in when things are down. But that definitely works better in sideways markets than it does in trending markets. And I absolutely have no clue how to synthesize this idea that for 10 years, we've definitely been in what looks like a, a bull market. Well, what looks like it? What, what is a bull market? But there have been some pretty pronounced steep dips along the way. So at what point do you call it a dip? At what point do you call it something else? Speaking of these like numbers, uh, um, you know, uh, the kind of number theater, this whole idea that 5% is a correction, 10% uh, or, or what is it? 5% is a pullback, 10% is a correction, 20% is a bear market. <laughs> That's right. complete number theater. It's pretty arbitrary. Yeah, exactly. So where would you draw the line? Right. Who cares? <laughs> right. I, I'm pretty sure in 2011, we went down 19.9%. Um, so we couldn't call it a bear market. And then you get to say stuff in 2019, like we've had a runaway bear market for 10 years straight. But had we gone down an extra 0.01% in 2011, you wouldn't be able to say that. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I find similar intrigue to your thought. Um, for a while, you know, I, I, I've heard people debate this like, do you want to do research on stocks making 52 week highs or 52 week lows? Now it seems like, I, I think it depends on the time and where you are and where the markets come. But now it seems like an interesting time to start spending a lot of time looking at the lows list and see if anything interesting comes up and be business model first, uh, getting to know it. Yeah, I love looking at the low list as well. So we're we're we're, we're the same in that regard. Um, and and that's a great point on on the arbitrariness of those numbers. I mean, 
you know, so last year we had a bear market um, in March 2020. And the bear market lasted, what, a month or <laughs> not even? Uh, so I, I'm not sure you would actually call that a bear market. You know, that if that to me is a correction, <laughs> even though it was very pronounced. And if you wanted to buy it uh, when it was 5% down and then double up when it was 10% down and buy even more at 15 and 20, you probably would have gone broke. And yet... I don't really think that was a true bear market. That was kind of a shock uh, that we came out of uh, super quickly and then actually continued on a very strong bull run. Yeah, I remember, I think it was just like a week after the bottom where people started tweeting out, we're in an official bull market because we're 20% off lows. And it was basically just three days that were green. Um, I, I find that stuff to be absolute madness. And Meanwhile, here we are today where we're talking about like the average stock is in correction. Uh, Sorry, the average drop from your highs is getting near what you'd call bear market territory, but the indices are nowhere near that. So you could, again, use numbers to paint whatever story you want to make out of this all. Um, And I like, Phil, how your topic is going to be threaded through literally everything we talk about from here on out. (laughs) Well, I just, I mean, yeah, I look, I'll find it super useful. You guys don't have to, you know, let it dominate. Your thoughts as much as it might mine, but yeah, like I do think it's uh, it's interesting, and I wish I knew what to make of it more. And you know, part of me also thinks that you know that, that the Forrest Gump like lucky idiot kind of thing has been it's, there's it's not all bad either. So I don't know, you know, you, you, I risk at least personally overthinking some of this stuff sometimes, and you know, I, I don't know what to do about that at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you know, sorry, I I have headlines crossing my path, but thinking about numbers, right? I think this one's pretty relevant. Like we've spoken about this before as well, the IAC complex and this uh, monthly reporting of revenue trends at their companies. And it's like, I I, I don't think having more information necessarily helps. And I don't think having more frequency necessarily helps. And it could lead you to want to make more decisions than you'd otherwise be inclined to make and slowing things down has huge advantages. And relatedly, I'd been thinking about, and it's probably a podcast topic on its own, but you know, as I was reflecting on Richer, Wiser, Happier, um, Jason Karp, who came up in one of the later chapters, was, yeah. I think, what, what I'd call far more trading oriented. And the rest were far more like buy and hold style investors. And Carp was the youngest of all the people featured, and yet he burnt out before any of the others. And I think there's something to be said about how if you have to be right about everything all the freaking time, you're going to burn out really fast in contrast to people who make like a few decisions a year and just think on a different dimension. Um, so I think that's directly related to how much uh, how, how rapidly the fire hose is spitting stuff out that you have to synthesize. Yeah, I think it was... Uh... I don't remember who it was that said their only big regret or drawback about you know a thirty or forty year career uh, was that he had to be basically chained to his Bloomberg every day, like seven days a week, you know at least three hundred and sixty days a year kind of thing. And there's something to that. And like he persevered. Uh, it might have been Steve Mandel at Lone Pine. I can't remember, um, but you know it takes a basically a freak athlete to put up with that kind of mental beating every day and and come out the other side with your sanity. And, but I think it just depends on, on what you're doing or what you're trying to do. I mean, again, that's where if you wanted to have owned Amazon for the last 20 years, which everybody holds out as the gold standard of, you know, alchemy, because you, you could have made a simple investment of common stock and it would have changed your entire life. If you wanted to have actually done that, everything that happened along the way was numbers theater. And all the pullbacks were buying opportunities. And it would have been, by the way, if you'd have looked at a chart like the one Elliot was just describing, it would have been below its year-to-date high and its all all-time high, you know, by double digits for sure, the majority of the time. So you would have had a great opportunity to continue to to accumulate. But you know, that's just so easily said and so difficult to, to actually do. So it's one of the things I'm struggling with most this year. I sat here in like January, February thinking to myself, you know, some of these things are pretty far ahead of themselves. They'll probably have a little bit of a rough go for the next few months. 
And then you end up in it and you're like, wow, maybe, you know, you're questioning yourself. Should I have sold and then bought back or looked at something else? And it's like, no, actually the process is simple. Like you have to be willing to hold through some of these things. You have to be willing to face the pain. Like uh, I've, I've referenced that uh, Avondale post of the 10 best stocks from the 2000 to 2010 period. And the smallest drawdown over that period in the 10 best stocks um, was, I think, like just north of 50%. Um, not to say you want to like sit through 50% drawdowns in everything you have, especially not simultaneously. But, you know, um, I think, Phil, you said it pretty early on. Most of the time, the market's not uh, sitting at all time highs, it's below it. And most stocks aren't always at all time highs, they're below it. So you got to, um, you know, have the mental fortitude to sit through that while also asking yourself the question, am I, am I still right? Or am I wrong? Has something fundamentally changed in the actual business? And that's a big advantage of private equity. You never have to think on that dimension. Well, you don't, but it, you know, at some point the economics and the valuation do matter. I mean, again, I, I always think about if you own the whole business, what would you continue to do? Or if you own 51% of the business, would you buy another five or 10 or 25% at this duly reduced price? And, you know, for every tale of glory about having bought more Amazon at the right time, you know, I, we talked about this, I think it was just last week with, with somebody as brilliant and successful as Bill Miller, who was, or uh, what was the guy's name, Joe Lewis, who was buying Bear Stearns all the way down in the financial crisis. If Bill Miller was buying countrywide at every tick, on the way down, right? And he evaporated billions of dollars doing that. And that's the risk, is that you made a lot of money coming in, you were right, you were celebrated, and now things have changed. Now what are you going to do? So yeah, to your point, Elliot, I think the real the real magic sauce of private equity is, well, largely the non-recourse leverage. But, uh, <laughs> more, more importantly than that is just the fact that you're not tempted with a quotation every day, right? So if you do get a chance to buy more, it's really just because it's almost going to be framed to you as something opportunistic, right? Somebody else needs liquidity. So do you want to step in opportunistically and buy more at a price that you're either going to see as attractive or not? And you're going to have a more thumbs up or thumbs down kind of view of things rather than the, you know, kind of system one, like everything's a panic. What's my response fight or flight that you get in the market with a bunch of numbers flashing at you on the screen? Yeah, I think also people sometimes weigh uh, history too much. You know, they look for patterns in everything and they think that these patterns are going to repeat forever. And I think that was the mistake in the financial crisis of 2008 um, because, you know, those companies, it would have been smart to buy the dip if the crisis hadn't been that bad. Um, but it was bad enough that actually Bear Stearns went under and Merrill Lynch went under and Countrywide went under and a lot more probably would have gone under uh, if the government hadn't stepped in. Um, so I think the big money is made or lost at points where history doesn't really repeat or you know maybe some kind of a one in one in a once in a century type of event uh, repeats but not your typical pattern of markets kind of going up and down um but ultimately you know all these companies surviving is going concerns because that's really what it's what what it's about when you're an equity holder if you have a company that over time is going to um go up um, and is going to survive as a going concern without some massive dilution, yeah, then you can buy the dips. But if there is some you know, really bad event that can make the equity worth zero and you're buying on the way down, you can literally blow through your entire bankroll or AUM or whatever you want to call it. Um, so... I think you know. I think we guys we've surfaced a few really uh, interesting topics here. You know, also um, I think the um, the issue of um, kind of looking at too much information. I think Elliot, you just mentioned that. Where I feel like that can lead to overconfidence without really leading to you know, you having a much smarter investment thesis, uh, you're just going to be much, you're going to feel like you have a much smarter investment thesis because you have so much more information. But at the end of the day, it's just going to make you 
much more confident and in some cases overconfident and, and lead to major mistakes. So I think we have a lot to, uh, to visit in the coming episodes. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for another great discussion. And thanks to everyone for listening. Goodbye for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.